All right, good morning, welcome back. I hope you had a good long weekend, uh, relaxing, all the rest of it, such is life, right? So we continue on. Um, today we're seven days in already, it goes fast, right? Seven of uh, 30 or so. Uh, today you got two handouts. We got exercise 107, which is what we're gonna work on today. You also got assignment 102's handout. That's not due for another couple weeks. So it's due not, it's like not next Monday, but the Monday after. But I figured I'd give it to you in advance so you can start thinking about it. You don't really have the skills to do it yet, so I wouldn't jump to trying to do it. I'm just trying to get it out there that this is what's coming so you can be mentally thinking about it. Uh, I'll show you a bunch of examples in two lectures so that you can uh, kind of be ready and, and get your ideas out, et cetera. So today we're going to talk about HDR photography, uh, also known as high dynamic range photography. And I think it's something that's very important to discuss um, for two reasons. One, I think it's a, it's a fun technique. Um, it's an artistic technique. It lets you play around with photos and, and get some stuff that isn't normal out of them. But it's also something long term that you'll use um, when you start rendering um, in Rhino or whatever. You're going to use these kinds of images. So it's good to be aware of how they work. Uh, and how to make them, uh, et cetera. So what exactly is a high dynamic range image? Uh, it's the, the problem is that our eyes view a high dynamic range image live. Cameras don't. Uh, and the difference is that we can see detail in very low light conditions. And then when we flick to bright conditions, our eyes automatically adjust. So um, bear with me for a second, okay? Look down at the floor or down around your computer and you see that there's kind of a dark shadow, right? But you can see that there's, there's little bits of carpet, there's little bits of uh, dust or whatever, you can see that, right? And then if you really quickly go from there to immediately looking outside, your eyes will adjust quickly and you'll see all the details in the bright sunlight that are outside. I know it's 8, 8 a.m. so it's not exactly the brightest sunlight in the world, but you can try this. Right? The point is that your eyes and your brain can process this so fast. Right? You would immediately adjust. Now, as we get a little bit older, right? not all of you are in this category yet. I'm starting to happen to me. If we're in a really bright room and then we go into a dark room, it takes a while for our eyes to adjust back. Right? Maybe a few of you, a few of you are smiling. Right? You might have experienced this. Um, it takes a while for our eyes to adjust back. We're, we're experiencing low dynamic range at that moment. Right? It's, it's the ability of us to, to switch that, that gives us the greater dynamic range. So what we do in the world of photography, because we can't expose this high dynamic range naturally, is we try to, to uh, perform a set of techniques that mimic the way our eyes see the world. Uh, and so that we have to go through these kind of techniques to try to figure it out. Okay? Um, so why? why? Why do we care? First reason is artistic reasons. Uh, it's, it's that we want to actually have a photograph of the sunset the way our eyes see it. Right? And I think I mentioned this before in the beginning of class. Anybody ever try to take a picture of a sunset and you were there and it was spectacular and then you took the picture and the picture was like, eh. Right? That happens. Okay? It's because our eyes are seeing a greater dynamic range than the camera can. So for artistic reasons, we might want to take a high dynamic range image so that we can try to capture what we actually saw. Right? Now we might also push the envelope a little bit, and I'll show you a bunch of examples later on, where we might make the image more surreal, even more exaggerated than it was when we were actually there. Um, so that's, that's another reason. Um, we, we, the, the goal of which is always to mimic how we see the world. Right? Uh, and so that's the artistic side of things. If we go into the rendering side of things, right? This is something that we're going to use extensively, uh, specifically in the, the second, the Digital Tools uh, for Architects Part 2 class. Um, when we're doing Rhino and V-Ray renderings, the, uh, the purpose here is that we can use it as a background image. And if we use this high dynamic range image and we adjust settings within the rendering engine itself, so the physical camera, the, uh, you know, the exposure of the scene, how much, what time of day it is, how much sunlight is in the scene, the background will change and adjust for that, um, that, that, that image or that time of day or, or et cetera. So it's really, really useful. It's hard for you guys to grasp it yet because you haven't done these renderings. But as you move forward, we're going to get into, oh, you need your HDRI image. You need dropped into the background, et cetera. 
So there, there is a dual purpose to this. Tone mapping is basically how do I reduce the contrast in the image? So I have this high dynamic range image. I still can't see all of the, uh, the, the information that's in the image. And we'll, we'll, when we do this live, this will make a little bit more sense. How do I kind of distill it down so that I like the image that I'm seeing? Right? This is the make the image that is the high dynamic range image, make it actually pretty, which means selectively changing certain parts of the image uh, and adjusting contrast in those particular parts of the image. Um, it's, it's either going to create an image that is kind of photorealistic, or it's going to push the envelope and make it a little bit more on the artistic side. Right? So it's going to reduce the dynamic range contrast ratio of the entire image while retaining localized contrast. So between neighboring pixels. So things that, like, like in here, instead of having this be completely black, right, we get all of the little piers. Right? The edge of the boat here, instead of having that be completely black, we actually get the detail. A projector is always a little hard because you can't see it quite as well as I can. So what are our software choices for doing this? Well, guess what? Photoshop. <laughs> Photoshop class, right? We ought to be able to do it. So the, the primary thing we'll do is uh, merging to HDR, which is an automated process in Photoshop. So that'll take the images and put them together. Uh, and then we'll do post-processing. A lot of the same techniques we've done in the past, right, where we do some curves adjustment. Curves are kind of the most common, but we might do some levels, etc. But we're also going to selectively apply this to only certain areas of the image. So we're going to use something today called masking to be able to control where something is applied to the particular image. Okay? And this is kind of a key technique. Um, there is no built-in tone mapping to Photoshop, so it won't automatically do it for you. Um, but it is available here for all of you to work with. There is another pro software program. It's called Photomatics. It is the gold standard for doing this. All the professional photographers use this if they're going to do HDR image processing. Um, it's really good. They changed their pricing structure. It used to be a lot more expensive. Uh, now it's between 40 and 100 bucks, depending on which version you pick. But the academic versions are 60% off. So if this is something that's really interesting to you, you might consider um, getting it. Um, it's, it has plugins that run within Photoshop, but it also has a standalone application that will actually do this processing uh, for you. It's a very, very cool piece of software, kind of specialized. So let's look at some examples so you can kind of see where we're going. And then really, we'll get into the technicalities of how do we do this and how do we do the masking, which is the point of today. So I, I divided these into uh, the realistic category and the artistic category um, so that you can kind of see the difference. Um, this is the most basic example of where you might use HDR photography. So the top is the image without HDR. The bottom is the image with HDR. Okay? And so what we're getting here without the HDR is that we have a picture. The inside is reasonably exposed. Right? If we look out the windows, we get no picture of view because it's all completely white. Right? And you may have tried to do this, right? where you're in a building. It's a beautiful view. You want to take a picture. You want to capture the view, but you also want to capture everybody sitting inside. Right? We get this, or we get exposed for outside, and everything inside is completely dark. In a high dynamic range image, we get the inside exposed nicely, but we also can see all the detail out the windows. Right? And so let's say you were working for a real estate company, and you needed to photograph a building because you were going to try to rent it or sell it or something. High dynamic range. Right? That's what you'd want to do to be able to see it. So uh, another example, a lot of nighttime photos do it because they give us a little bit bigger depth of color uh, in a nighttime photo, but again, relatively realistic. Okay. Might be something like this, where it's just a nature scene, but we're trying to get all of the detail along the shore so that we don't lose that and get it uh, oversaturated and black. Right. Again, another nighttime scene, where we're trying to, to get the light and kind of that, that mood, the little bit of fog uh, that's part of it that would be hard without. Uh, an image like this, this one's a little hard because the projector washes some of it out. Right, but if we didn't have a high dynamic range image, all of this underneath would be just completely black. By making it high dynamic, dynamic range, we can actually see that detail and get a little bit more out of the photo. Right? This one's borderline because the sky is a little bit over, overdone. But we're getting the sunset, and we're also getting the contrast of uh, you know, the, the street scene at night. One of the things, because we're merging multiple frames together to create this, 
we get things like the artifacts, like we have the rear end of the car here, and then we have it again, right? Because it's taken as a series of three photographs. They may be really close together, but this any th object that's moving is going to have a little bit of that blur. And so we have to be aware of that. I think there's a couple versions of the person standing there, too. Uh, so it depends on how fast you, you shoot those images, but it's something to be aware of. Movement can be challenging when it comes to these sorts of images. Another example, nothing exaggerated about this. Very plain, very simple, but we're getting, and you can see it on um, the lecture notes later on, we're getting all of the detail and the texture that would be in here. This is extraordinarily br bright against something that's extraordinarily black. Right? In order to get the detail in the black and the detail in the white, we're using high dynamic range. Another example here, we're trying to show the detail underneath that uh, overhang while still being able to see the rest of the, the context. Here, kind of a sunset scene. If we were exposing correctly uh, just one, not high dynamic range, we'd lose the detail in the, the rocks and the shadows and stuff. We get that detail, but we also get the nice sunset um, by doing this technique. Right, similar, kind of a hybrid late, late afternoon slash night. We're getting a little bit moody sky, which is one of the, the challenges in this, uh, depending on how, how far overboard you want to get. Right, sometimes you can barely tell that it's a high dynamic range image. Right? Again, detail in, in, in the shadow instead of having it completely black. Right? This looks very much like a normal image. Nothing exaggerated about it. Uh, but we're getting, uh, and you start to learn kind of the little bit of a texture that is part of a, a high dynamic range image. But we're getting all the detail in the bottoms of the rocks and stuff that we otherwise wouldn't get. Right? This is one of the sample images that you'll get as part of your package today if you choose to use it. Um, we will be able to selectively control sky versus ground, et cetera. Right? And then here's several pictures of sunsets. Uh, I have a couple of these as examples. Same kind of thing, where you wouldn't be able to get this detail uh, without it. OK, so let's look on the more creative side. Right? This is the exaggerations of reality. This is where you're pushing a particular mood in a picture. Right? So this is in San Francisco, but it's, this isn't really what it looks like. Right? So the colors are a little bit oversaturated. The sky's a little bit too foggy, et cetera. But we can push that a little bit further. Right? This is the, the total haunted house look, right? where we're really starting to exaggerate sky, mood. I mean, that black of a sky would be rather challenging to get in real life. It would have to be right on top of a rainstorm or something. Right? This is almost a painterly quality. Right, where we're starting to push the boundaries of it. There are certainly parts of the image that are very realistic, but other parts are, are mostly in the sky are starting to, to go a little bit beyond. Right? Uh, this is not what the Golden Gate Bridge looks like. Right? So we're, we're again, we're pushing it. And there comes a point where maybe you push it a little bit too far, uh, but the point is you, you have this control within high dynamic range images. This one's not quite as far, uh, but the, the sky has a lot more black in it than is, in, than is normal. A little bit of an oversaturation of color, but again, in the same vein, a little bit more exaggerated. Uh, here, we're getting way too much in like the wood texture. It's, it's, it's really overpowering. Um, and so it's, it's worth being aware of. Again, very moody, very black sky, black and white image, uh, almost grungy. All right, pushing, pushing again. And you're seeing kind of the trend of the skies are what tend to get blown out first. OK, so we're going we're gonna to move from this over. OK, so um, for this exercise, in, um, in the exercise 104, where he went out and took pictures, you may have taken a set of images to process into high dynamic range, uh, which is you generally call the bracketed set of images. If you did do that, you're more than welcome to use your own set of images. If you didn't, I have a set of images that are available for you as samples. Uh, if you go to the digital tool site, obviously you have to log in. Go to today's exercise, 107.
and at the bottom, there is, by the way, uh, a couple of the um, tutorials, video tutorials that will walk you through how this works. Uh, at the bottom here, under downloads, we have a zip file of uh, the high dynamic range sample group 1, 2, and 3. You can pick any of them that you want. Uh, I'm going to download the first one here. And I want to show so that I can get it. And then I'll extract it to my flash drive. Get my flash drive loaded correctly. Come on, flash drive. There we go. This is exercise 107. And I'll go ahead and extract this. All right, so I have these three images. Uh, this looks like this set is a sunset. That's fine. Uh, Image group two and three, I'll download those, those as well. Um, so I have three different ones to try. You only need to do one set, so it's up to you as to which one. Uh, let me extract these. Okay, so I went ahead and I did several sets, um, and then we can then play around with these, and I can show you different examples. Again, you don't have to pick all of them. You can just pick uh, one set, and it's up to you. So from here, I'm going to go ahead and open Photoshop. Remember, I need to open Photoshop CS6, not CS3. This is one of the times where it will make a difference. The post-processing is much easier in CS6 than it is in CS3. So I'm going to go to All Programs, and I'm going to go to the Adobe Design Standard CS6, and I'm going to go ahead and open up Photoshop CS6. And then I'm going to go ahead, and in Photoshop, um, this process of merging these high dynamic range images together is available as an automated process. So if I go to File, and I go to Automate, I'm going to see from this list, Merge to HDR Pro, right, which is going to allow me to click on this, and it will bring up an automated process that will prompt me through this, which is great. So I'm going to go ahead, and under Files, I'm going to click Browse, and I'll go to my flash drive, which is where I saved all of those files. And I'll pick the first three. right? There should be three files. What I did is I clicked on the first one, I held down Shift, and I clicked on the last one. Right? I could also hold down Control and click on each individual one. It doesn't really matter. And I'll go ahead and say OK. And I'll get those three images together. Okay? I want to make sure that the checkbox for Attempt to Automatically Align Source Images is checked. Um, this corrects for if you're shooting those three images and you slightly shook while you did it. If you didn't shoot it on a tripod, um, it accounts for that shake, and we'll try to, to match up based on the features in the image itself so that you don't have blur um, of, of features that are the same. So I'll go ahead and say OK. And you can see that it's doing a bunch of stuff. Right? Now, this used to take a really long time. It doesn't take as long now. Right? And then I get to the Merge to HDR Pro dialog box, right? which basically says, I've now merged these images together. You can see down here at the bottom 
right? We have the center image is the one that's exposed correctly based on what the camera thinks sh should be exposed. We have one that's underexposed, we have the dark one, and we have the one that's overexposed. So you'll end up seeing these three images together. It's those three images that are actually being combined together um, into one. So over here, uh, we have a variety of presets, right? And so th this is one of the nice things about um, Photoshop is it's giving us a bunch of presets. Uh, we can choose which of the presets we want. We could go City Twilight, for example, and you see that this changes. If we went to um, more saturated, we get a version that has more color. Right? If we went to photorealistic, we'd get something that's kind of reasonable. Right? Um, and again, you can, you can play around with what the presets are. Right? Sometimes the presets give you the best uh, example here. Right? If we go back to default, we'll see what the default said. There it is. Um, Hold on a second. I want to double check that there isn't an option that I want to show you here. Good. We're going to go back to local adaptation. The only thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to um, come down here, and there should be, right, it'll show you the advanced, but there should be a little tab for curve. If you click on that, I'm going to drag over the black point just a little bit. So we see the histogram that we're used to. The white point is up here. Uh, the black point, I'm going to pull it over just a, a bit so that it's right where the, the image starts. Right? So it's just a subtle adjustment. And I'm actually not going to do any other curve adjustments to it. And I'll go ahead and say OK. okay. And we'll let it finish. And I end up with the final image, which really isn't too bad. Right? It did a fair amount of the, the processing for me. It, it did a pretty decent job. Okay? But from here, I want to be able to make some individual adjustments. But in order to emphasize how this process worked, I'm going to do this for each of those sets of images so you can see me do it and repeat myself. Right? And so if you followed along, that's great. I just like to repeat it so that you guys see it several times as to how I'm doing it. So if I go up to File, and I go to Automate, and I go to Merge to HDR Pro again, this time I'm going to click on Browse, and I'm going to pick the next three images. And again, you only have to do it for one set. Right. I'll hold down Shift and select the three images. I'll go ahead and say OK and OK. And it will start processing. All right, this is a view from the top of Half Dome, right, looking out into Yosemite Valley. Um, so same thing here. Right? I can go through and I can uh, look at the defaults here. Right, depending on, on one of the defaults. And if you like one of the defaults, there's nothing wrong with choosing one of the defaults. Okay? Um, but I'm also going to go in here. I'm going to go back to default. I'm going to go to curve, and I'm going to make an adjustment. And this time, I'm going to pull the black over to about there. Right? And I may pull the white over a bit, too. Right? Eh, that's too much. Right, we'll go back. I'm losing too much detail. Okay? Pull this black. And again, it's all by eye. So when I'm done, I'll go ahead and click OK. And it will create that file for me. All right. It looks like maybe I pushed it a little bit too far. Okay. I'll do it one last time for the last set of images. I'll go to File, Automate, Merge to HDR Pro. I'm going to click on Browse, and I'll pick the last three images. Go ahead and say OK. OK. There we go. So again, I have the three images showing at the bottom. I could choose from the presets. Excuse me, there's the presets, depending on what I wanted. Right? But I can also modify the curve here so I can make this a little bit darker, etc. This one needs to be lightened. So let me change to saturated a bit. Yeah, I don't like that. Definitely too much. Ooh. So this involves a little bit of uh, playing around. So bear with me here. Let me 
go to default and start messing with it myself. All right, we'll make some adjustments later on. I'll go ahead and say OK. So this is probably a good example of I really didn't get the image that I wanted. It didn't turn out that well. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and make some adjustments on this uh, image itself. So let me go to Layer, New Adjustment Layer, and we'll start with Levels. I was like, okay, and this is the same kind of thing that we've done before. I want to lighten up the image, so get a little bit more of the white. We'll get a little bit more of the black. And it's not, you know, that already is making a bit of a difference. Okay, but I really, I need to do more to this particular image. Uh, and what I'm going to do now is when I do the next adjustment layer, I'm actually going to look at not the sky, but just down below the ground. All right, so let me go to layer, new adjustment layer, and let me do a curves adjustment. And I, like I said, I'm not paying attention to the sky. I'm just paying attention to the ground. Right? So what I want is I want to find a way to make the ground look better. Right? So maybe we'll, we'll do that with it a little bit. We'll increase that there. Yeah, maybe it should go right there. So I'm looking primarily at the ground and changing, changing what happens there. I'm not concerned with the sky. Right? And so if we look at it, it made an adjustment to the sky, but I don't know that I necessarily like that adjustment. Right? But what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply what's called a mask to the layer so that's, that only a part of this image happens. Let me, let me do it one more time for the sky, because I want to exaggerate it so you can see it, because you're not seeing the ground here as much as I'd like. Let me go to New Adjustment Layer. Let me go to Levels. Oh, excuse me, Curves. Right? And this time I'm working just with the sky. Okay? So you can see there, there's a really moody sky. Okay? And again, it makes the bottom of the image almost way entirely too dark. Okay? And again, I'm exaggerating this a little bit so you can see it. So what I'm going to do is I want the adjustment that I applied to apply only to the sky and not to the ground. Okay? So what I can do is I can come down here in my layers, again, making sure that this layer is highlighted, which is the one that's actually doing the adjustment to the sky. Right? Making sure that that's highlighted. I can come down here, and there's a button for Add Layer Mask. It's a rectangle with a circle in it. Looks, of course, I have no pen. Looks like that. Okay? And if I click on that, oh, excuse me, it's going to add the vector mask. Never mind. I don't have to click on it because the mask already is there. Okay, you see on this layer, we have the adjustment, which is the little circle. Right? Next to it is a white square. Okay? The white square represents the mask that's applied to the layer. And so the best way of thinking about this is, let's say, have anybody ever spray painted before, right? where you cut out a stencil and you like, tape it down and then you spray, and some of the, the paint goes through where you have a hole and it doesn't where you have the tape? Does that make sense? Okay? This is essentially doing the same thing. Right? We're, we're saying that the adjustment, right, the, the color change or whatever, is the spray paint. And we're either letting it go through or not letting it go through. And we're controlling where that happens using this mask. So this mask is like the piece of paper or the tape that we're taping down. Okay? So with it selected, and you can see that I have these little box around this white square, I can come over here and I can use the paintbrush tool, which is right here. And don't worry, I'm going to do this more than once. Right? And I can paint with either white or black. Right? Black is as if I'm, I'm painting on or I'm taping down a piece of tape. So the adjustment isn't going to be applied. So I'm going to make sure that my foreground color, the one that's in front, is black. And I can do that by clicking on this little uh, double arrow. And it will flip so that the black is in front. And then I'm going to use my brush. Right? We're going to make the brush a little bit bigger here. Right? And I'm also going to make it a hard brush so that I have a sharp edge. And I'm going to paint the ground. Right? And so do you see how what I'm painting changes? Right? The adjustment up here is no longer applying to here. Okay? We can also see over here in the square that now I'm getting black. Right? Where this was used to be just a white square, I'm getting black. So let me go ahead and I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. And I'm going to paint off the bottom. So this is as if I'm laying down masking tape. 
and not allowing the adjustment to be sprayed onto my image. Right? And so I'll get a little bit closer here to the edge. And then we'll zoom in. I'll press Control plus to zoom in. I'm going to hold down space bar to pan. Obviously, I need this to be a little bit smaller. Right? And I'll come along here right along this edge. And paint right in here. And I could spend a little bit more time being a little bit more precise, but you get you get the idea. Okay? Now every once in a while you're going along and everything's good, right? And then your your arm twitches, right? And you get something like that. Right? Whoops. Mistake. The good news about a mask is it's completely reversible. Okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch from black to white. And then I'll go ahead and paint over here. And it goes right back to as if I'd never done it. Right? And so maybe I have to paint a little bit more there. Right? And then I can flip my colors again back to black. And I can continue up. Okay? Now, I can continue getting more and more precise. So if I zoom in a little bit more, right, and I shrink my brush down, right, I can work on these little details. And so the level of detail is going to depend based on what you're actually trying to do in your image and how much uh, you're trying to adjust it. Right? I'm not going to sit here and make you guys watch me do this all the way along because you don't need to, to waste your time doing it. The point is that we can have an adjustment that's applied. And I'm going to kind of do this quickly here. To part of the image, but not part of, not the whole image. Let me flip my color because I was a little bit generous there. All right, and we'll do the same thing here. Let's make this a little bit bigger. So again, black is not allowing the adjustment to be applied. All right, so something like that. So if I press Control Zero, we can see that. When I click on and off this adjustment, it's only changing the sky. The rest of the image hasn't changed. Okay? So the key here is that when we do an adjustment, we're doing it just for a specific part of the image. Right? So for example, if I went back to this image, right, I might want to make an adjustment because I don't like how these rocks are turning out in the foreground here. So let me go ahead and go to Layer, New Adjustment Layer, and let's try a Levels Adjustment first. See if that changes a little bit. Yeah, I still don't like it. Let me do a curves adjustment. All right, so again, I'm adjusting it so that I can see these rocks nicely. Right, The background is now way too dark. So on this layer, while I'm clicked on this white square, I'm going to use my paintbrush in black, there's black, we'll make the brush a little bit bigger, and we'll not let it be applied to the rest of this image. Like that. And so now, once again, up here in the mask, see how it went from being an entirely white rectangle to having some black and some white. right? And so the adjustment is now applied to just the bottom part of that image, right? not the rest of it. So I can do the same thing if I didn't like the relative lightness of this part of the image. right? I can go back and go to Layer, New Adjustment Layer. We can go to Curves again. Right? This time, I'm going to work on just the middle part of the image here. Right? So I'll go ahead and mask off. Here's my mask. There's my paintbrush. I'm going to paint in black. I don't want it to be applied to this part of the image. And again, I'm not being the most precise on the edges here. Um, you will spend a little bit more time getting it right. All right. So now it's, it's not 
it's, it's applying to the center section, but I also want it to um, not apply to the sky. So let me go up here to the sky, and we'll paint that in. That. And again, I'm using the bracket key to make these adjustments to the brush size. So in reality, in this image, I need to spend a little bit more time because it's, it's showing too much at the transition. Right? And I probably am exaggerating this more than I normally would. I'm just trying to show you the technique. Right? So now, this particular adjustment is applying right, just to this section. Okay? So let's jump back to the first image here. Right? And this time, right, for argument's sake and for showing this, this technique off, I'm going to go to my uh, layer, new adjustment layer. I'm going to go to channel mixer, say OK. And I'm going to check the box for monochrome. Right? I'm going to do black and white with an orange filter, something like that. OK, so this is very clearly changing the image. Okay? So just to illustrate the point again, right? I'm going to go on my mask here. I'm going to go to the paintbrush. I'm going to go to black. Oops. And I'm going to paint in the sky, and I'm going to get the color back. So let me go ahead and paint in the sky, and the color comes back. Right? So there's a good example of it. Now, I don't have to paint in just black or just white. If I want a little bit of the color to come through, but not all of the co color, right? I can choose to paint in a gray. So let me go ahead and paint in kind of a, a medium gray here. And I'll get some of the color, but not all of the color. And actually, I'm going to go ahead and paint half of this image so you can see it. Right? So if we look at it, if we look at my mask here, I now have gray, black, and white. Right? We can see that it's being applied, but not all of it. Right? And depending on the shade of gray, if I went to a lighter gray, something like that, it would get closer and closer to black and white as we go across. Okay? So I have a lot of flexibility in terms of what color I, I choose to, to do. The other thing that I can do is I can fade from one to another. So thus far, the brushes that I've always used have been 100% hardness, so they have a sharp edge. I can instead use a diffuse brush. And so let me do a new adjustment layer here. And let me use a diffuse brush so we can see you guys see the change? Ah, you can't see it well enough. Let me go back to that black and white one. I have to do a little bit of this based on the um, projector so that you can actually see it happen. Right? OK, so in this instance, instead of having 100% hardness, I'm going to change the hardness of the brush to be soft. And you'll see right, that when I click, the color comes in the center, right, but it fades on the edge. It's no longer a sharp change. It would be so nice if you guys could actually see this. Let me turn this off all. Right. Oh, I need to change my color. Sorry. Go back to black. OK. So you can see that it doesn't have that sharp edge that I had before. Right? It's a blurry edge as I paint it back in. So I have a different set of flexibility here depending on what the ultimate goal of the image is. Right? And so sometimes doing something like this is an easier way of transitioning. So I don't have to be quite as careful. All right, we'll paint that part back in. All right, and then we'll paint it in here. But I'm not going to paint it in the water. That's going to stay gray. And so now we can see there's full color, and there it is where this middle section is in black and white. Okay? So the point is you have a lot of flexibility. So the key today right, is to actually work on 
one of these images to make it look as good as you can, right? But to use mass to selectively apply certain things to certain parts of the image, right? And so if you want to push the boundaries a bit, right? If you wanted to say, <clears throat> let me go to layer, new adjustment layer. Let me do a, um, let's do a hue and saturation adjustment, right? And let me change the hue. Right? So we can see that now the sky is red or purple or whatever. Right? Obviously not realistic. But I can now apply the mask again. So let me go ahead and go to my paintbrush. We're going to paint in black. I'm going to paint off the bottom half of the image here. Right? Strange hue not applied except.